Okay guys, so here is your lab for muscle fatigue for X physiology. Um, I'm going to get going. I did this with help from Ian, Saul, and Mike as my lab rats. Um, and then I obviously had to include some testing on myself. But this is going to be just a demo and little explanation of different types of muscle fatigue we can encounter. Uh, where they're encounter, where you'll encounter them along the neuromuscular pathway, uh, whether it's in the muscle, sort of what's called peripheral fatigue, or in the nervous system, what's deemed central fatigue, the differentiation between those two, and sort of uh, a little demo of an exercise that may or may not contribute to one of those. Okay, so get going here. Okay, so. The first thing is we need a definition of what muscle fatigue is. Back in the day, um, there's one of the first instances of people reporting sort of a muscle fatigue. Um, you would think that it would be workers even earlier, but some of the only written correspondence is this um, not only mental fatigue, this weariness described by soldiers, but soldiers that were unable to um, complete their capacity or their uh, active duty, uh, lifting things, moving crates because they were too... Uh, muscularly fatigued. So some of the r earliest written correspondence so that led to people studying it to try and alleviate some of these effects and create more effective soldiers was one of the first instances. But we need a definition to start of fatigue. So um, a great definition taken from a uh, Gandivia Carroll and um, Janet Taylor paper is that it is a decreased ability of the muscle to produce maximal force. So you can't pr produce the same maximal force that you would because your muscle is fatigued. Or if you're looking at working at submaximal forces, an increased requirement of neural drive to maintain that sustained submaximal force. So on the left there, if you were fatigued, if or let's say I had you do a 1RM, and you're fatigued, you shouldn't be able to do that same 1RM. If you gave, if I gave you that same load, you wouldn't be able to pick it up or I'd have to take some weight off in order for you to pick it up. On the right side, let's say I asked you to pick up a 10 pound dumbbell. Now, because you're not working at a maximal load, um, in order for me to tell that you're fatigued, I would have you do, let's say five curls with that 10 pound dumbbell, rate it how hard that is out of 10. There's ways to experimentally measure that, but I'll get into that in my lecture when I see you guys in class on March 11th. Um, but I would have you, let's say, a very basic way, uh, curl it five times, give me a rating out of 10. You say it's a three out of 10. I have you do five more sets of that. And then at the end, I have you do the same five curls with that 10 pound weight. And then I have you rate that out of 10 again. And you say now it's a five out of 10. So that's an increased requirement of the drive um, we call sort of what you would rate as the uh, difficulty of it or your RPE, um, the amount of descending drive from your motor cortex. Um, that would be a, an example of increase of neural drive to sustain that submaximal force. So you never actually hit max. We don't know what your max is. We don't know if your max is decreased or uh, what it ever was, but we still know that you are fatigued from that submaximal um, contraction. So uh, there's obviously a lot of sport applications to fatigue, but what we're kind of interested in is what different exercises may result in different types of fatigue, because then if we have strategies that could alleviate that, um, we can we can work on that and uh, know a little bit more about it. Um, I put the link down here. This Backyard Brains, uh, it's a little EMG experiment in fatigue, but I'm like a science nerd about cool figures, and I think the illustrations in this one are fantastic, and I'm definitely going to use them in a couple more talks, and I really, really like these illustrations. Um, but if you want to take a look at sort of the general neuromuscular pathway um, that goes into a muscle contraction, this is a great depiction. Um, so you have your upper motor neurons or your um, great pyramidal neurons in your motor cortex. Um, so that strip that you've probably looked at in intro to neuro is your motor homunculus. In the fifth layer of those, it has these aggregator uh, large neurons um, and that they descend and you know that they cross over um, from, let's say, the right side of your brain to the left side of your body at the pyramids. That's why they're called the pyramidal neurons. Um, so where those... Uh, where those neurons descend from, that's sort of where you would originate a lot of your cortical input. You also have some spinal input into your uh, upper, from your upper motor neuron into your alpha motor neuron in your spinal cord here. I'll probably use my pointer because uh, that's always a good way to do talks instead of just talking at the figure. Okay, so um, you have descending drive from your motor cortex into your alpha motor neuron in your spinal, in your spinal cord in the ventral horn. Um, and then you have motor output there. So you have uh, input from a bunch of other uh, 
um, afferent inputs as well that would come back up into the spinal cord and feed from interneurons within the spinal cord, um, sort of subcortical areas in your brainstem, and again, those cortical areas into your alpha motor neuron. We know that your alpha motor neuron and your muscle fiber are, your, are, are all the fibers it innervates, are termed your motor unit. And that this is uh, the alpha motor neuron is sort of our great summator. It summates all the information it gets. And then with a little bit of tweaking in its intrinsic properties as well, we get once we get a firing of that alpha motor neuron, we get output to all the muscle fibers that it innervates. So at the level of the neuromuscular junction, we have acetylcholine released onto our muscle fibers that uh, that results in a depolarization of the uh, muscle itself, um, utilizing calcium to flow through the T-tubules, um, uh, allowing the muscle to then utilize ATP to um, activate the myosin cross bridges. Then calcium flows back in, uh, exposing that binding site of troponin on the actin to allow for rebinding uh, and movement again using AT or phosphorylation from ATP to ADP and uh, going through that power stroke bringing these Z bridges um, closer together, or like bringing your uh, Z plates closer together on the sarcomere. Okay, so that's just, again, brief overview just to remind you, should probably um, got all that in uh, physiology, but we're gonna move on to do what's uh, sort of keeping that all in mind. We're gonna do our mini demo. And the way I've set this up is uh, I have four of our participants here, and they're all doing a slightly different task. So our main test task, the one that we're going to do pre and post, is a left leg max knee extension. So using your quad muscles, um, and what that's going to be doing is, again, kind of like the left figure I talked about at first, we take an absolute max, and then if there's a decrease for max, it's really easy for us to say, okay, that was fatigue that we saw. We aren't doing anything very unique here experimentally, so we can't say what kind of fatigue we saw, but this is going to integrate nicely into how I talk about techniques in the lecture, where then, having this in your mind, I want you to take some guesses at what type of fatigue we're seeing in each experiment, and uh, at what sites you think it's fatiguing, and then, then uh, you can have those uh, ideas affirmed or not affirmed in the lecture. Um, okay, so what Saul is going to be doing is yeah that pre and post um, max leg extension but his task in the middle will be an almost identical leg extension but instead holding for 30 seconds at 50 percent of his max capacity um, it says seven times here he actually did it five uh, i changed it a little bit on the fly for me i'm doing a 20 minute cycle erg test at 120 watts roughly 80 rpm uh, so just a sort of close to fatiguing i I'm going to leave fatigue up to you guys, but uh, like a an aerobic fatiguing task uh, over 20 minutes, uh, 120 watts is about 60%, no, probably about 45% of my um, uh, aerobic capacity at, at the max of a, a VO2 max test cycling right now. Uh, so then Mike came in and what I had him do was isotonic contractions. These would be so he did his pre, then he stayed on the machine to do isotonic contractions, and you'll see these are very similar to what a, a cable leg extension would be in the gym. So it's a dynamic contraction where saws were completely, completely isometric, um, exactly like the pre-post task. Mike's going to be able to move his quads, actively con concentrically contracting them, and then eccentrically contracting them as well, um, with about 50 pounds of force, and he's going to do sort of a standard 3 by 10 as if he walked in the gym through 50 pounds on the leg extension. Finally, Ian is going to be doing hand cycling on our hand erg at about 50 watts for 20 minutes. You see me pop in a couple of times because I think we had it at about 30 watts to start, and I wasn't as fatigued, like, um, aerobically fatiguing as I wanted. Um, his RPE wasn't quite high enough, so I bumped it up to about 75 for about the last five minutes. So I'll go through each of those and we'll take a look at their numbers. But if you again want to take a look at a paper so you can try and guess, um, I uh, think that knowing the difference, at least to guess between central fatigue and peripheral fatigue, it's good to know that basically if you draw a dotted line, that denotes the difference sort of halfway through a peripheral mixed nerve, um, breaking your alpha motor neuron, so like cell body and axon hillock and everything upwards, uh, that is uh, upwards to your um, motor cortex and even other cortical areas, that is 
determined as central fatigue if there's a failure from one of those areas to drive the muscle. And then below that, from the neuromuscular junction, right through all the muscle fiber um, down to the cellular level, that is what would be termed peripheral fatigue. So that is the difference between central and peripheral and sort of where we draw that line. And if you want to read more about that, I go back to this a lot. Nick Ladelfa goes back to this a lot. Uh, I really, really like this paper. It's mainly talking about recovery, but because it isn't going into every aspect of fatigue, they do a really nice, succinct, brief explanation of fatigue in order for you to understand how those measures recover. Uh, so I really, really like this paper. If you want, um, there are other ones that are more advanced. You can ask me about uh, cellular mechanisms or uh, cortical mechanisms of or spinal or of fatigue, uh, and I can supply those. But those are again 35, 40 page uh, review papers that are just a bit, a little bit too in depth. This one is a beautiful, nice little succinct paper that has a couple really nice figures which summarize it. A lot of years of research, they summarize it really well. Okay, so here is the video assault. I will play this. I'll go get my pointer off there. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm setting him up on our dynamometer. Um, this area right here has a load cell in it, and that will measure the force which he outputs from his leg on this arm. Again, everybody's moment arm is different, but he is going to be putting out a torque around this, so it's uh, pretty relatable to between everybody, but it's only really relatable to himself here in this task. So he's going to push out, he's going to do a little trial contraction, and that's what it's going to look like on the screen. Then I'm going to get him to go really hard here. We need a max. Push, 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 push. You give him your best midwife impression. Really try and encourage your participant for about five seconds. I try and get a max for about five seconds every time. And then um, what we're going to see here is Saul going through his 30 second holds. And again, um, the reason I say we need a max in, if we want to see if there's any actual functional decline is because if somebody wasn't trying their absolute hardest, it's very hard for us to pin down, are they trying at 50, 55% for them to replicate that pre and post is almost impossible. It's very easy to replicate a 100% activation and then we know if they're 100% activating, we have dysfunction in the system somewhere that is limiting that total activation. So again, he did his max. Here I asked him to then maintain a, uh, a sort of set target of 150 Newton meters. Uh, I believe his max was around 200, so about a 75% task. Yeah, um, so definitely not easy. And if anybody's sort of done this, it's not the most fun thing in the world. I definitely gave Saul the least fun one, and you can already see that it's starting to get less and less fun into set two. Nobody goes to the gym and does 30 second isometric holds at 75% of their capacity. They don't just lift up a deadlift and just hold it in their really low position for 30 seconds. So that's, that's essentially what his protocol was. Um, sometimes, again, it can be not the most comfortable on the shin there, so I'll adjust that. Uh, fast forward through this a little bit here. <laughs> you can see he's hurting. <laughs> okay, and then he's going on his last one. This is uh, looks like it's lagging a little bit, but um, you can start to see that he's already having difficulty maintaining even that 75%. So I started him off with a submaximal task, but at this point, in the protocol, it's maximal. Cause if he can't maintain that, he's already down to 80 by the end. All right. So he's got one more. He's trying his absolute hardest. And again, it is really hard to maintain the willpower to do this. So really encouraging a participant, having a participant who's willing to try and gut it out. Uh, you can see him breathing heavy. He's really putting a lot of effort into this. I can tell that he's not just sort of sucking it through the tests, like really dogging it, trying to make sure that he just gets through it. And you get some participants that do that. So now we have his final max. And okay, that was it. That's essentially a quick little protocol. Um, we'll go in and we'll take a look and at the data. We have his pre-MVC um, as 198. 
and his post as 171. I don't know if you guys have to do any calculations for this, but I'm just going to sort of present the data as is and let you take with it what you will um, at face value. And again, make your guesses and then we'll talk about uh, the actual reasons a bit more in the lecture. But uh, I'll let you guess as you go here in the video where, again, looking at this figure, where you think the majority of that fatigue was occurring and why. Okay, so the next one is going to be me. And again, I'm doing the cycle erg test. So Ian has me set up here. Okay, and oh, he needs to click start there. Okay, that was the trial one. Well, the real one in a second here. There you go. Clearly breathing heavy to try and get everything I had out of that one. Um, and haven't done that in a while. So, you know, get me out there. And yeah, get me on the bike, got it set up, Ian uh, applies the resistance, and yeah, I don't. I fast forwarded this at 10 times, and it's honestly not fast enough. There's not much to see here. Again, I'm cycling. Okay, so I cut a little bit of that out, um, just it's really long, and me just cycling. Honestly, nothing much to see there. Obviously, Saul and um, some Mike's, some of the other... Uh, some of the other protocols were a little bit quicker than this. Mine and Ian's, again, a little bit longer. Take from that what you will. Um, so once I'm done, my RP is at about probably a 15. Uh, yeah, Ian measured my heart rate to be about 173 by the end. You can see I'm wiping some sweat out of my eyes. Uh, so I was definitely uh, slightly uncomfortable aerobically by the end. Um, the legs were feeling it. So after that, got me on the dynamometer. And uh, the screen record didn't work here the way I wanted it to, so I'm going to fast forward to the end and just put that, put that in. You can see my final trial in which I conduct my post max. All right, so we'll, we'll move on. Taking a look at that, uh, my pre number was a 225, uh, and then I had a 203 at the end. Okay. Again, taking your best guess as to where uh, that fatigue was occurring along the neuromuscular pathway. We'll move on to Mike doing his uh, isotonic contractions. So this is the final isometric trial uh, before his max. He's going to do his max right here. There you go. Push, 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 push. Mike's was pretty high. He was up there with Ian. Uh, they, they beat both Saul and I. So he's going to get a 30 second rest here and then he's going to go into his uh, isotonic contractions which are just like a leg extension at the gym. It's going to um, it's going to be yeah, pretty much a dynamic contraction very similar to what um, what a leg extension at the gym would be. There you go. So he's got about 50 newtons on it and then he's kicking it out and in like if you went up to a cable machine at the gym you can see Mike's got pretty good muscle definition on his VMO there. You can see he's working and you can see by the end of the set of 10 he's working fairly hard. Not necessarily to failure um, but he's definitely working hard and this is typical of what people would do at the gym if they were looking to get out multiple sets um, most people wouldn't look to fail on their first set. So I really wanted to replicate what that would be like. Okay, so he had some rest in there. He's doing his other ones. Again, there's about 50 pounds of force on there. So he's got one more set here. By the end, we could see a little bit of shake on him, but uh, nothing amazingly strenuous and okay so we had him do his post trial after 30 seconds and there you go there you go he's gonna do his max all right so what do Mike's numbers look like? He went from a 244 and he went up one Newton. Hardly anything, but still he went up one Newton to 245. Uh, so uh, that again, you're going to see that obviously by our definition of fatigue, it didn't necessarily hit the decline in maximal force. Um, whether Mike would say he had to increase his um, 
his neural drive in order to maintain those lower levels of force we don't know because again there are ways to measure that uh, we didn't measure that so by definition here he wasn't necessarily fatigued but uh, you can still take a guess at which system would apply if the load was slightly heavier and I just wanted to leave that in because when you're doing quick experiments like this it doesn't always work exactly the way you want and uh, there is a, a property called uh, neuromechanical potentiation uh, which does affect the opposite side um, of fatigue when you are doing brief sort of um, near maximal contractions like that so finally we have Ian and he is doing a hand cycling protocol so we have Ian do his uh, max just hammers that on I think he got Mike beat there by a little bit all right so then we have uh, Ian doing his hand cycling and again the wattage was pretty accurate but a little low to start and then we upped it right at the end so he got into that 15 to 17 RP range just like I was um, but again using a uh, a fairly distant muscle from his quads not using his quads at all um, but stressing the aerobic system um, into what pe normal people would generally call sort of a, a taxing state so again I'm gonna fast forward through this because these aren't all that fun to watch even at 10 times which I thought was fast enough when editing the video and by the end t -t -t -t, there you go we got him back on he's gonna do his post trial There you go. Okay, let's take a look at Ian's numbers to finish it up. He went from 251 to 243, so we got a slight amount of reduction in that maximal force. And again, taking a look at what uh, Ian's final numbers were, uh, where do you think that that fatigue occurred um, by doing some of the research yourself and uh, thinking a little bit about uh, what we said up top. Um, so that's it. That's the uh, muscle fatigue little lab demo and uh, I hope to see you guys all in uh, in lecture have a good one